Okay, so I think it's um, 4 p.m. in uh, Central Europe, so we can start. So welcome to the Landscapes uh, live seminar series. So today is the first uh, seminar and we are very happy to uh, welcome uh, Anneline Gertz from the University of Bergen. Uh, but before listening to Anneline, I will give you some info and some guidelines on uh, what we have defined for uh, Landscapes live. Uh, so first, this seminar is the first of the spring series uh, that will continue in the following weeks uh, with some other excellent speakers, including Liran Goren, Bob Hilton, uh, Fiona Club, and Georgie, Georgie Bennett. So you can find all this information on the uh, Landscape Live uh, website. Uh, so just to let you know that the speakers were chosen based on the wishes of the Landscape Live team, uh, which currently includes uh, uh, Pierre Valla, Charlie Chaubet, and uh, Wolfgang Schwangart, and myself, sorry, Philippe Stepp. Uh, so we are already plan planning a second seminar series this fall. So if you're interested to give uh, a talk or if you have some uh, suggestion or if you want to give some comments on the uh, organization, please feel free to, uh, to contact us. Uh, second, some good uh, practices. So we are currently using a Zoom option that is limited to only 300 participants. Uh, so if these seminars be become very popular, we'll consider uh, upgrading to the uh, webinar option. Uh, to have an almost unlimited number of uh, participants. Um, because of this, we don't have access to the uh, uh, question and answer option uh, that was used during the uh, steepest descent. So if you want to ask a question, there are two possible uh, options. Uh, you can either uh, ask them using the chat or by raising your hand if you wish to use the mic to ask your question. But in any case, you will only be able to ask questions at the end uh, of uh, Anneline, Anneline's talk, and the chat will be uh, deactivated uh, during the talk. Uh, and please, I mean, it's uh, kind of silly to say that, but we insist this is a formal seminar series, and we will ask you to remain cool and polite uh, during your exchange with, with us. Um, so we'll convene this talk with uh, Vivi Pedersen and uh, Charlie Chaubet, uh, who, will, who you will see during the, the questions uh, after the talk. And uh, this talk will end at uh, 15 past five. So uh, yeah, we have like uh, one hour of, uh, of talk. Uh, so now we can move to the interesting part of this talk and listen to uh, Anneline uh, just after a quick presentation. So Anneline is currently a, a PhD student at the University of Bergen. So she volunteered to give this talk as a kind of a, a rehearsal for a PhD defense that is uh, occurring uh, next Monday, so very soon. And we uh, really greatly, greatly appreciate, uh, appreciate sorry, your effort to prepare this talk. And we wish her good luck with uh, our defense. Um, so Anneline's talk will be on uh, drainage, drainage integration in continental reefs. So thanks a lot, uh, Anneline, for giving these talks. And I now give you uh, the stage. <laughs> hey, thanks, Philippe, for this nice introduction. So uh, yeah, hello to all of you. And uh, yeah. I'm very honored to give this first Landscapes live talk. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me, but also for setting up this seminar series, which I think uh, will yeah, become a great success. So I will now start sharing my screen. Uh, Hold on. I'm not sure. Uh, Vivi, am I allowed to share my screen or? Yes, you should be allowed. If you just press the share screen. You should get the options to share your your uh, PowerPoint. What happens if you press share screen? I only see so I, there's no PowerPoints coming up while it's open. Uh, Maybe you just share your whole screen then, and then make a full screen in PowerPoint. Yeah. So if I just do this. Yeah, that should work. And you see my screen now, or? Yeah, yeah, we do. If you just okay. make it full screen, then I think we're good. Okay. Yeah, 
Yes, perfect. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so, uh, hold on, I just made it small. Okay. So uh, what I would like to present today are uh, two papers from my PhD project. So both papers are related to drainage integration in continental rifts. Um, so uh, yeah, oh yeah, and of course it's not fully my own work. So I listed the, my co-authors and supervisors at the bottom. So I would like to thank them, of course. And um, so I'd like to start this presentation by showing this, this picture. Uh, from the Central Apennines, which was kind of the main motivation behind my project. Uh, and you can see in the front a sedimentary basin that's subsiding relative to the topographic ridge in the background. And this relative movement is uh, accommodated by a normal fault system. Uh, so you see it sketched by the white line. And uh, these basins, full bounded basins, are characteristic for the Central Apennines. And that's because this whole area has been uh, affected by extension over the last three million years. Um, and most of these basins, they are now connected by, uh, by through going river, river systems, but they uh, had lakes in them uh, during the early Pleistocene. So, on the long term, we see a trend from uh, mainly internal drainage to mainly external drainage. So that's what I call drainage integration. And I added a subtitle, as you can see. Uh, yeah, it's a question, but it kind of also reveals my view on it. So uh, the question is, is it a simple consequence of tectonics or climate, or is it a factor in its own right? Okay. Mm. So, um, yeah. Uh, drainage integration is a very common, uh, commonly observed phenomenon in uh, continental rifts um, and it has major implications both for landscape evolution in general uh, as well as basin stratigraphy. Uh, still, we, yeah, we have a, quite a poor understanding of uh, why it happens and how it happens. Uh, so this is, um, yeah, this was kind of the main motivation to to contribute to the, our understanding of uh, this phenomenon. Uh, and there are two main uh, conceptual ideas out there. Uh, so first of all, uh, that basins become integrated because of heterod erosion. Um, so that's, yeah, or river piracy or capture. So that's an aggressive river system that uh, is kind of in an upstream direction um, capturing basins. Uh, the other idea is that it's dominated by overspill of basins. So basins simply get filled up with sediment uh, and water and spill over. So um, I approached um, yeah, this uh, topic uh, by means of a combined numerical modeling and uh, yeah, field-based uh, approach. So first I will introduce you a bit more into the Central Apennines. And then I will uh, present my main results from my numerical modeling study, followed by a geomorphic stratigraphic study of one of the major river systems in this area. And I end with some final thoughts. Okay, so here you can see uh, a topographic map of the central Apennines. So the colors they represent uh, different elevations. Uh, the maximum elevations in this area reach up to 3,000 meters and i hope you can also see the black lines so here yeah, all those black lines which are the normal fault systems so it's quite a wide array of normal faults uh, which are all active and um, which have been active uh, mostly uh, yeah so the last two to three million years uh, regional extension is in the order of three millimeters per year and uh, this area is at, at the same time it has been uplifted uh, with a maximum rate in the order of one to two millimeters per year. Uh, and what's very nice about this area is that we have a lot of constraints on fault slip rate data and uh, yeah, quite a good understanding of how this fault area uh, developed over time. Uh, besides that, we have uh, a lot of studies 
um, of the basin stratigraphy of the, the major basins in this area uh, and a, a very good time control, uh, yeah, in particular because of the, uh, the large amount of tephra in this area. And then at the uh, bottom of this slide, you can see a topographic cross section. Uh, so it's a swath profile with a, a maximum, minimum, and, and the mean. Um, and then I sketched uh, some of the normal folds in there. And then you can also see that the blue dashed line, that's the kind of the approximate pattern of regional uplift. So the coastlines, they were more or less stable, um, but the interior of the area has uh, gone up with about 1,000 meters. So here you can see a drainage network map. So with, with in the black lines are the, the divides. Um, so these are all the basins that drain towards the coast. And then in the middle, you see this thick uh, blue line. That's the main drainage divide between uh, the Tyrrhenian and the Adriatic Sea. Uh, and then, uh, so you can see that uh, there are some large uh, river systems, so that the more lightish blue lines, um, so those are connecting most of the basins. But there's, for example, one major basin, that's the Ficino Basin. It's positioned right at the, at the main drainage divide, and that's the one that's still endorheic. Uh, and mainly because of uh, the position of this endorheic basin, uh, it has been uh, thought that um, it has been mainly had with erosion that uh, integrated the, all the other basins and that Ficino, uh, because of its position, it is the one that survived. Uh, and then um, I plotted here two uh, river profiles of two major river systems in this area. Uh, and, and you don't need to see all the details in there because I, I know it's quite small. Uh, but I hope you can all see that there are some major nick points in there uh, of at least 100 meters high, um, which, uh, yeah, I think are, are mainly related to drainage integration. Um, so then just to give you an impression of, uh, yeah, some pictures from the field. So on the right side, you can see a picture of an uh, active fold scarp. Um, and then in the, in the center, you can see uh, the Eternal River, which is the uh, the main topic of my second part of the of the talk um, and then on the left side you can see, uh, see typical sediments from this area so that because um, many basins are incised we have quite nice outcrops uh, so you can see the, the more clay yeah what is it calcareous clay uh, fine-grained lake sediments with tephra layers in there and here's a very nice picture of a, a delta sequence so a Gilbert diet the type delta. So then I continue with the first part of the talk. So uh, I will now present my numerical modeling results. Um, so for this part I used, uh, so I performed a regional scale um, landscape evolution, um, what is it, uh, study uh, using the surface process model cascade. And I allowed cascades to uh, respond, uh, so let service processes respond to both regional uplift and normal folding. Uh, the normal folding I simulated by means of a, a fold map from the area, so the black lines are uh, folds in the area. And I used that as an input for an elastic dislocation model to, um, yeah, to calculate what the elastic response would be of the surface, so the vertical components only, um, to kind of get a first order approximation of, uh, yeah, this, the surface deformation pattern. So then for the regional uplift, I uh, used the Gaussian function that I fitted also by means of, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, observations of the uh, total uplift. So you can see it, it's, uh, it's not perfect, but it's kind of, it gives the overall pattern of most up uplift in the center of the area and more or less stable coastlines. So then the fluvial algorithm in a cascade uh, follows the under capacity model. So according to this model, the change in elevation is a function of the disequilibrium, 
between the uh, transport capacity and the sediment flux. Um, so the transport capacity is a function of the erodibility and the discharge and uh, the slope. So it's a linear relationship. And then we have the sediment flux is just uh, integration of all the sediment that's coming up from upstream. And then we have two uh, parameters to control the ero erosive conditions. Uh, and LF is the sort of fluvial length uh, parameter. Uh, with that one, you can also mimic a, a bit uh, between, uh, or change a bit between detachment and transport limited uh, behavior. Um, so if you think, okay, this is uh, quite a simple model setup. Um, I always have to think about uh, a quote from patients when I started this project uh, and when I tried to tune the model uh, uh, yeah, to look as good as, um, as the Apennines. Um, and then she said, if you want, you can model a cow falling from the sky, but it doesn't mean it's useful. And then actually, um, if you Google this, a uh, cow falling from the sky, there actually turns out to be a model uh, about this and it's quite hilarious. So maybe it is useful at the end. Um, so here you can see uh, the topographic evolution of my model. So here you go from one and a half million years to three million years. Uh, so again, the, the colors indicated the topography and the dark green areas are the lakes. Um, and there is a uh, generation of relief at two different uh, scales. So we have fault-related relief. So here you can see it in the cross-section. Fault-related relief and regional relief. Uh, and then there is uh, sedimentation in the basins and erosion of the uh, football areas. And, and after three million years, there's still uh, an increase in uh, both the mean and the max. So it's a transient landscape evolution but we know that's also the case in, uh, in the Apennines. So here again, uh, the same time steps, but now I focus really on the drainage network. So you can see, you can see at the beginning there's a large area that's internally drained, that's the, the, the shaded area. And then over time, this area shrinks uh, and sediment is now transport, of, transported out of the area that's affected by folding. Um, so we see uh, a drainage integration uh, pattern, uh, the disappearance of lakes and local base levels, uh, and the progressive export of sediment out of the rift. So here you can see the lake areas decreasing and the endoreic area as well. Um, and uh, of course, a nice thing about a model is that you can exactly see uh, what's happening. So we can see that uh, the, the reason why the basins become integrated is because uh, they overspill. So they become uh, fully filled with, uh, with sediment. And then it's, um, what is it? Uh, there is an integration event. So the, the water simply spills over and goes to the, to the next basin. Uh, and this results in uh, the initiation of a wave of erosion that starts to propagate upstream. Um, and of course, uh, an implication as well of such a drainage integration event is that, so if this is the sediment supply uh, for the different basins and this is time, so if the most upstream basin, um, uh, what is it, becomes overspilled at this point, here the sediment supply decreases because it's now bypassing the basin and then now it goes to the next basin. So here the sediment supply goes up. So this means that the histories of uh, basin filling are a function of all the basin filling histories upstream. So here you can see the erosion deposition maps. Um, so in green is deposition and in red is um, erosion. So you can see that over time, uh, there's becoming less deposition in the basin and that's simply because they become integrated. So more and more sediment is now by bypassing those basins. And you also see that uh, the area becomes more red, so it means erosion rates go up. Um, and locally they are very high, and these are the, the, the locations where uh, just an integration event happens, and now you get a very deep 
gorge uh, forming and, and probably terraces in the in the basins uh, so you get those waves of, of uh, yeah of erosion um, yeah and, and very interesting of course here I'm now just showing sometimes uh, snapshots but uh, this is a really highly dynamic landscape evolution and if you plot the river profile, so here again one example. Uh, so this is the in, in, in um, black is the line is the situation just before integration. So you can see. Uh, so those are basically two separate rivers, um, and then they become integrated, and this whole profile has to adjust. So you can see a nick point that's migrating. Uh, and this means that at the spill point, there's a sudden increase in uh, incision because of the increase in discharge. Um, so this uh, means, so these results suggest that uh, while it was hypothesized that it's mainly headwood erosion that uh, causes drainage integration in this area, um, that the model at least suggests that it's more the opposite pattern, so that it's Basin overfilling or lake overspill. So instead of a bottom up pattern, it's more a top down pattern. Um, and because, um, yeah, most field evidence that we need to distinguish between these uh, processes is often not preserved just because of the erosion that follows integration. Um, I kind of took this difference in spatial temporal pattern uh, for my next paper. So as a kind of criterion to, to distinguish between them. Um, and overspill, of course, it, it, uh, it means that, uh, that there's an important role for the balance between basin filling and subsidence. So here, just a cartoon of a basin uh, with, with a lake and the folds and sediments and the spill point. Uh, and I will not go through all these factors, but uh, of course, it depends on the, the balance between water and sediment supply and uh, basin subsidence. Uh, but also, of course, in, in, a, in a closed basin, the, the elevation of the spill point is important. Uh, and as soon drainage integration has started, uh, it's not just, uh, what is it, climate and, and, and just erosion rates that, that, for example, control sediment supply, um, but it's also just a yeah, simply the drainage integration process itself uh, because you get sediment and water from upstream basins. Um, and in the model, uh, the reason why we got overspill uh, is because there was an increase in sediment supply, supply related to the progressive increase in relief and erosion rates. So I'm, I'm not sure if I mentioned, but a very important aspect of this model was that we kept both um, uh, faulting and regional uplift constants. So basically everything was constant, uh, except from uh, the sediment supply, simply because we increased the relief. Okay, so the main findings of this first part is that um, drainage integration reproduced, or was reproduced by a combination of regional uplift and normal faulting. Um, that, um, yeah, we get a highly dynamic trend in landscape evolution, even if tectonic forcing and climate are constant. Uh, overspill, so a top-down pattern rather than headwood erosion drives drainage integration, and that the balance between basin filling and subsidence is of key importance. Uh, moreover, this model demonstrates that drainage integration leads to abrupt changes in erosion deposition patterns, a marked variation in sediment and water supply to the basins, changes in sedimentary environment, so from lacustrine to fluvial, and we see discrete waves of river incision, terraces, and gorge formation. Okay, so um, yeah, these findings of overspill uh, from my first paper kind of motivated, uh, of course, to look in the field for if this is really the case, because at the, yeah, after all, it's a model. Um, so what I did, I did for one of the, the river systems in the area, uh, which uh, crosses several basins. Um, I try to integrate all the data that's out there um, 
to, uh, to compare the stratigraphic records from the different basins and to compare it with uh, the geomorph geomorphology uh, of the, so the longitudinal profile as well as the terrace morphology. So I basically reconstructed the integration of this river system using uh, the river profile and terrace analysis and integration of basin stratigraphic data. So I, for, for every time for kind of, so two neighboring basins, uh, I, in detail I compared what's happening in the upstream basin and what's at the same time happening in the downstream basin uh, when an event occurs. So, yeah. Um, and of course, with the, the, this idea in mind that uh, as soon as you have a drainage integration event in the upstream basin, you get a transition from lacustrine to uh, fluvial deposition. Um, and then in the downstream basin, you get an increase in sediment and water supply. And at the same time, you get uh, an, an erosion wave starting propagating upstream. So the type of data and observations I uh, looked at is, so first of all, uh, the lack of strength fluvial transitions, uh, but also in more detail, I looked at, uh, what is it? Um, so what is happening around this transition? So for example, if uh, one basin so if, if it's um, uh, so near the transition, so in the lacustrine uh, sediments, if the, the transition is gradual, so if it's, um, yeah, what is it? If it's, um, uh, for example, if you go from deep uh, uh, lake sediments to delta sediments, uh, then you can see that it's more, that it's becoming overfilled. And then um, also the sedimentary contact, so is it erosional? Or is it yeah, a more gradual transition? Uh, and then for the longitudinal profile, I looked at the convex reaches. So are these, can these be explained by, for example, an in, increase in slip rates or uh, by lithological contacts? And then uh, I also compared the ages of the river terraces surrounding those. Um, uh, so it, yeah, in, in the different uh, basins. And then in this area, there's a lot of time constraints. Uh, so from paleomagnetic analysis, biostatigraphy, and tephra analysis. So uh, this is the river that I use. So this is the Eternal River uh, here in blue. And this is the catchment. Uh, so the drainage defined around it in red. Uh, so it's about a hundred kilometer long river with six main basins. So here you can see the lithological map of the area. So this is all, uh, the orange color is all the um, limestone. And then there's a, a bit of fleece, uh, but it's, yeah, overall it's mainly limestone. And then we have the, um, uh, the basin infill. Um, and then we have fault slip rate data. Uh, and yeah, a pretty good understanding of how this system evolved. So there are some ideas about that those defaults increased uh, their slip rates over time. And then we have uh, basin stratigraphic studies with good time control. So here you can see the longitudinal profile of the Aterna River. So, um, and then first of all, you can see there are uh, three major nick points in, in, in pink. Uh, and the, uh, the upper end I marked with a, a yellow star. Uh, and then in, in gray shading, uh, those are the sediments, so the sediment thicknesses. So you can see that for some of the basins, the, um, uh, what is it? Yeah, uh, the, ri the river is uh, deeply incised into the basins. Um, but for some areas, it's, it's not. So it's, it's, it's quite variable along the river. Um, and then, for example, just to give you an idea of the terraces, how they look like. Um, so here you can see a major terrace. So it's, uh, for example, here it's 150 meters uh, above the Eternal River. Um, so these are really what single terraces, very deeply incised uh, and much higher than, for example, what the, the, the terraces that have been, uh, the terrace dimensions that, ha that have been inferred uh, related to climate. So here you can see uh, 
yeah, very schematically the, the basin stratigraphy of the different basins. So on the right side is the most upstream basin, and on the left side, the most downstream basin. Uh, and this whole period is appro approximately the quaternary, so the three million years. Um, and uh, well, you don't need to see all the details in there, but uh, I hope you can all see that the, the bottom part is dominated by bluish colors. Those are lake sediments. And then at the bottom, oh, sorry, at the top, you can see all the, the more uh, brownish colors. Those are the fluvial sediments. And then there's, for example, this dark uh, blue unit in the, in the middle. That's, uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, the, the uh, Gilbert Delta deposits. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, and then the, of course the, um, uh, the arrows, the pink arrows, are uh, the reconstruction of the drainage events. So when you go from either lacustrine to fluvial or from lacustrine directly to deep incision. So we have Andre uh, conditions at the bottom, and then so there is some time interval uh, around approximately 1.2 to 0 0.6 million years. Uh, then, in, yeah, most basins got integrated. Um, but I have to mention that for the upstream two basins, uh, the timing is more uncertain. So the, the lower, uh, the most downstream basins, it's quite certain, but those two are less certain. Uh, an important observation is that range integration started in the uh, middle reaches of the Aterno River. And a uh, very interesting, uh, I think, is that in some basins, we see that in the upper part, uh, there seems to be a transition uh, back to uh, lacustrine deposition. So those basins get underfilled again. And just to give you an idea that we also have data on the geometry of the basins. And in contrast to the, the previous slides, here you can see that there's also a lot of variability uh, between the basins. So even though they all seem to went through those, the, the transition from internal to external drainage, uh, they're also very different. So here, uh, just a simple reconstruction of the pattern. So what is it here at the top? Of course, it's the most upstream basin and then at the bottom, the most downstream basin. So here you can see that around 1.2, uh, the first basins here in the middle reaches start to become integrated. Um, and then also interesting is that one of the basins was first uh, flowing in the, in the opposite direction. So there's one major basin, it's the basin near L'Aquila, uh, that seemed to have acted as a um, uh, yeah, depot center for quite a long time. And then at some point, uh, and this, uh, what is it, interflu was breached and now you get a connection to the coast. So this pattern is, is not consistent, of course, with um, has with erosion propagating from the coast. Um, so yeah, how to explain this transition from mainly uh, underfilled to overfilled conditions? Um, so here I kind of tested, tested some ideas about this. So um, uh, what is it? So we, we know for the, uh, or we have some ideas for the folds that, uh, yeah, what is it? They're approximate throw rates for the first stage of extension. Um, and if we uh, correct the throw rates for uh, long-term um, estimates of uplift to substance, then uh, we can approximate that uh, the hanging wall subsidence is in the order of uh, 0 0.15 to 0 0.23 millimeters per year. Um, so that's kind of assuming that all the faults at that time slipped at approximately similar rates. Um, and if we use the thicknesses of the sediments in these basins, the lacustrine sediments um, and the ages, then we get approximately zero, uh, I don't see my, yeah. We get approximately 0 0.10 to 0 0.17 millimeters per year of sedimentation rates. And of course these are, for example, these are decompacted, uh, not de decompacted uh, rates. Um, so it's 
it's all first order, but it's a kind of gives some idea that uh, the rates of infilling were um, less than the rates of hanging wall subsidence. And, and then um, around the, uh, what is it? Um, so if we're here, so then uh, drainage integration started. And this, uh, around this time, we know we go from the early to the middle Pleistocene, and it's very likely that sedimentation rates went up simply because there was more erosion. Uh, and as, and there, is, uh, there are some estimates for this area that uh, erosion rates went up by at least a factor 10. Uh, but we, here we were very conservative, so we, we just had a, a doubling of our sedimentation rates. Uh, but, uh, but then you can see that the, the areas start to overlap more. And if you get an overlap, then of course basins um, yeah, are allowed to overspill. Um, and this is simply, this is a, a kind of um, only thinking about the, uh, just at one basin scale with, with its, its own football area. But of course, as soon as drainage integration starts, then you get upstream derived sediment as well. So that's not included in here. Uh, then we use the dimensions of one of the uh, largest nick points to um, yeah, simply estimate the, the uh, what is it, the rate of a nick point migration. Um, and then based on that, we uh, calculate, oh, yeah, we estimate that landscape, uh, so this, this profile, so this nick point, it takes another three million years to uh, equilibrate this profile. Um, and then just to give you some uh, examples of how um, drainage integration affects other uh, basins. So here, for example, you see that this was the first basin that became integrated. And so the time constraints on the transition in the upstream basin uh, is more or less the same as uh, when they uh, reconstructed the, the large Gilbert uh, type deltas to start prograde. So, um, yeah, I think this is simply because of the integration event. So that's in, in here. So suddenly, so here are the, the Gilbert, del uh, Gilbert delta type sediments. And then this whole area suddenly started draining into this basin. And then um, another, uh, what is it? Uh, very characteristic uh, aspect of drainage integration uh, is of course that you can have um, so-called ripple effects. So as soon as one basin gets overspilled, uh, you, you can expect the next one also to become soon overspilled simply because it suddenly gets uh, a lot more sediment. Um, so uh, this is yeah what I call ripple effect. So the main uh, findings from this second part is that the transition from lacustrine to fluvial sediments along the Eternal River evidences stepwise drainage integration between circa 1.2 and 0 0.65 million years. Uh, we see a predominant top-down integration pattern uh, that suggests drainage integration to be driven by overspill. Overspill can be explained by an increase in sediment and water supply relative to hanging wall subsidence. Uh, there's a relative increase in sediment and water supply uh, that we explain by the early to middle Pleistocene climate transition. But of course, another option would be the progressive increase in fault related relief. And or, as soon as uh, drainage integration started, an abrupt increase in upstream contributing area. Uh, and in the central Apennines, um, oh yeah, I forgot to mention this, uh, the rates of sedimentation and hanging wall subsidence are very similar, as you saw in that uh, diagram. So this allows tipping points between over and underfilled conditions to be easily reached. So this can uh, also explain why in the top stratigraphy, um, so the more the uh, late Pleistocene and Holocene parts, we saw some evidence for uh, uh, a reverse trend towards isolation. And important, of course, is that these transient effects because of drainage integration can persist in the landscape and sediment rooting 
system for millions of years. So then I would like to uh, end with some final thoughts, uh, which uh, yeah, I think are, are interesting sharing. So first of all, uh, that trains integration, uh, I think it's, it needs to be looked upon as an autogenic process that's inherent to many continental rifts. Uh, and it's really a factor on its own in addition to changes in, in factors like tectonics and climate. Um, and I, I simply noticed that it, it's often described and identified, but its impact tends to be overlooked. Uh, so for example, in the Apennines, um, uh, yeah, there are many publications describing it, strange integration, but as soon as uh, the, the studies look at um, stratigraphy, uh, then uh, yeah, this whole topic is neglected. Uh, and further, I, I wonder if, um, so I, I like to hear ideas about this. Uh, is there a bias in favor of headward erosion, river piracy capture? So, um, so there are studies that looked at um, how often overspill is, is part of introductory textbooks. Uh, and it turns out it's, it's not. Um, yeah, and also because there's a lot of a loss of evidence for the Paleo Lake and uh, overspill event due to intense erosion, uh, yeah, it looks like therefore the whole process doesn't exist. Um, headward erosion is, I think, often confused with upstream direct nick point migration. So maybe it's, uh, yeah, just simply uh, invoked too often. Uh, I think the efficiency of headward erosion is basically unknown. Um, but uh, yeah, especially of course, it's, it's uh, geological time scales. Um, and uh, I also noticed that some publications, they uh, exactly describe overspill, but then still call it uh, river piracy or capture. So, um, and I, I, I saw this uh, quote here, um, and I think I, I agree with this, that the term stream piracy, uh, it kind of suggests that the downstream river is the one that's really the aggressive one. Um, so if that's the case, I think it's, it, river piracy is a good terminology. Uh, but if it's simply overspill, I think it's not a, a, the best uh, term to use. Uh, and it's a very nice review paper about this in, in, uh, that just came out in geomorphology. So um, yeah, these are my kind of main points of this work. Uh, but I think I will leave it here and uh, I'm happy to answer your questions. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Annelien. Thanks a lot for, for this very uh, nice uh, talk. Um, so now the, the chat uh, is uh, open. So if you want to ask questions, you can use the chat or you can also uh, raise your hands if you want to uh, directly use the mic to, uh, to ask uh, maybe in a more uh, lively manner your, your question. Uh, but maybe uh, I will take the time to maybe ask one question, uh, waiting for other comments by uh, by participants. Uh, so, Annelien, I was wondering if you can have a, a kind of a reverse process from uh, drainage integration. If, for instance, you have some faults that can uh, uh, have some uh, slip rates that change quite quickly, can you imagine to have some situation where you uh, disintegrate your catchments? And you regenerate some kind of autogenic, uh, oh, sorry, endorheic uh, catchment, mm -hmm. and then uh, back again, uh, recapture or, or reintegrate um, by the process you uh, you, you you described. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think uh, so. We have observations uh, about that uh, in the Central Apennines, um, but it, so there because for some of the folds there, we know that they uh, increase their slip rate over time. So for some basins, we, we, we think at least, so in more in the upstream part of the Aterno uh, system, that uh, it's simply the increase in, in subsidence that kind of suddenly, uh, yeah, was it? It became more faster subsidence than infilling. So then we, uh, we know there are histor historical lakes over there. Most of them, are, again, are drained, but uh, yeah, so... Um, but then, of, yeah, so your question is if you then, of course, yeah, you can, of course, also go back again. You can yes. integrate the system again. But, um, but I think, especially in the Apennines, uh, yeah, because you have active faulting, 
so there you can have it going in both directions. Okay. So, uh, yeah. I think it can be interesting because you can, um, I mean, the process you described is only a transient one, but if you can imagine that you have some uh, autogenic uh, catchments that uh, get, uh, I mean, if you get some new auto, um, Andorre catchments, sorry, uh, mm -hmm. because of a kind of change in fault uh, slip rate, mm -hmm. you can still in the kind of uh, global steady state uh, configuration have this kind of uh, processes. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm, I was pointing to this uh, question. Yeah. So. I, Maybe we can shift to a question by a participant. So maybe Charlie, you want to um, to ask one of the questions? Sure. I'm I'm going to try to meld them both together because they're they're both on a similar um, similar tack here. So uh, Mike Steckler and Dan uh, Kettle are both asking about uh, potential climatic control on the integration events uh, that you described. Uh, mm -hmm. They're both asking how much uh, of the particular timing of both integration events and then potentially the reappearance of lakes uh, are related to, to climate fluctuations, even ones that might be relatively moderate in the geologic record? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so first of all, I, I like to say that, um, so in my reconstruction for the Eternal River, uh, so it, the, yeah, it, it happened that the first basin got integrated around the uh, early to middle Pleistocene transition. Um, but I also think that, so, so on one hand, it's, I think it's likely that climate has something to do with it. On the other hand, as soon as one basin gets overspilled, then uh, of course the other basins get overspilled more easily. Um, so in that sense, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I don't know if, if then climate is still really the overall dominant factor in this. At some point, drainage integration itself takes over in a way. So potentially climate is driving the first integration event, but then it's sort of a, a cascade. Um, yeah, because the well, then of course you, you suddenly get a doubling of, for example, if one other basin uh, starts draining there, so then you get a doubling of your, your source area. Uh, but also, of course, uh, the sediment in the upstream basin uh, is easily available. So it's, of course, much easier to erode. And um, so, yeah, it's a very easy source of sediment. Um, but also, of course, uh, the water itself. But so I, maybe you notice that in my reconstruction, of course, I focus on the sediment uh, and that not on the water. It's simply because the water is gone, so we, it's hard to say something about it. Um, but, uh, but of course, the, the water will play a major role as well. I'm sure about that. Great, thank you. Thanks, Lynn. <laughs> I just received um, another question in the private. So please, can you use, if you want to ask questions, can you use the public chat? Uh, it's a, a better uh, way to do it. Uh, so the question is, can you distinguish in the field a remnant lacustrine terrace from a fluvial one uh, by viewing a profile or by determine, determining sorry, textual differences. So can you distinguish from a, a lacustrine terrace from a fluvial one from field uh, observations? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, what's quite characteristic for the Apennines is that, we, that most of the lake sediments are topped by some a fluvial gravel layer. So in that sense, the lake sediments are, uh, what is it, quite well preserved, even though we have deep incision. Um, so it's, it's quite different than, for example, in the, in the basin and range, uh, often the lake sediments are at top, and then you get a, a, a lake overspill event, and then a lot of the fine grain material is gone. Uh, but in the Apennines, it looks like it's, it's a more gradual process. So first you get the establishment of a river system that's, just flowing through the basin and reworking the sediment and so it, it's really able to produce such a gravel layer and then it starts to incise um, yeah but i'm not sure is this answering so are you saying how to distinguish between the lake terrace and the yes um i'm not sure how you so you would say it's a lake terrace if it's directly incising. I, I don't have any answer to that. Uh, any. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not yeah. Okay. The question, but, uh. 
yeah yeah i so it yeah i think that if you have a, a situation like in the basin range and your lake terrace so really your fine grain materials at top then uh, of course the erosion is much more intense yeah okay so i can't see any other question can you see some charlie or um no i i have one but uh there are no more in the chat at the moment um I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Um, oh, and Luca Malatesta says he's writing one, so there, there will be one oh, shortly. Okay. <laughs> um, so I will, I will go first, and then we can go to Luca. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm wondering. This is probably a really silly question. Uh, if, on average, um, the sedimentation rates and the you know subsidence or accommodation creation rates are well matched, um, why are there basins in the first place to be filled and integrated is is it that subsidence rates are, or throw rates on the faults are initially uh much more rapid than erosion rates in the in the catchment sort of draining to that small basin and that tails off uh through time yeah well that's a, a really good point um so um so so yeah we have kind of an idea of uh, in general about fault evolution uh, so that often faults start to interact at some point and some of them increase their slip rates uh, some others become inactive uh, so that was kind of the conceptual idea um, that that's yeah I think yeah that people uh, had in mind when they analyzed the, this data set um, so but but I, I I'm sure that it's of course, in, in, nature, in nature, it's more complex. Uh, also, because in this area, uh, we have uh, inherited structures from the trust, uh, trusting phase. Um, so I'm not sure if, if this, yeah, if you can directly uh, say, okay, we have first uh, smaller uh, slip rates and then an increase on many of them. Um, but uh, yeah, so it was kind of funny when I made that diagram, comparing those. Um, so I, of course I had in mind, okay, this is a very first order graph, first order estimates, but we know that all the basins were internally drained. So in that sense, um, yeah, it's, it's trust, trustworthy that the sedimentation rates were lower than the accommodation creation. Um, so that was kind of, yeah, it's, it's then of course you know that it's, it's uh, this kind of sense in that diagram, um, but um, yeah. So I, yeah, of course it's very simplistic, but to first order, I think it captures the idea that first the accommodation uh, outpaced the sedimentation rate, and at some point uh, sediment and water supply went up. Right. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, we now have two. Uh, Can I just? Oh, Can I ahead. use my power here as well to yes, uh, override the queue and ask a follow because it's a follow up question because I mean in your model at least the, the the overall relief of the mountain range is quite low in the beginning right mm -hmm. so you're only building the relief as you go so couldn't that also explain why erosion rates were low lower than the the creation of the accommodation space in the beginning. So you really mean in the model? Yeah, but isn't the model supposed to, at least to some extent, uh, simulate what happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's more that in, in the model, of course, uh, the climate was constant. Uh, so in the model, it was really the increase in relief that was the only factor that resulted in the increase in sediment supply. Um, well, so that c could have triggered it. But also in the model, at some point, uh, as soon as it starts, you get the transport of sediment downstream. Uh, so also in the model, you get those ripple effects. Um, so, but you're saying if the, the lack of in initial topography, if that's uh, important. I mean, wouldn't that be enough to explain uh, that change you see, that you build the topography over mm -hmm. time? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, uh, well, of course, in, in, in reality, there was initial topography, we, we know. Uh, 
but of course so in the model um so this this whole trend was very robust so going from undersupply to oversupply basins um but of course you can change the eros erodibility constants uh, and so you you can speed up the trends or you can slow down the trends um so it's um yeah so at the end so so the trend was robust but uh so i think that the the what you choose for the erodibility factors is uh, more important than uh, the initial topography is that uh thank you yeah <laughs> Great. So maybe I can ask uh, another question on the uh, on the chat. A uh, question by Yu Chun Chang, if I pronounce it correctly. Um, so his question is about the uh, relative effect of possible uh, extreme climatic events uh, compared to kind of uh, more uh, continuous uh, mm. uh, climatic condition. I mean, can, I mean, do, does the evolution you see can be sorry? Can the evolution you you observe be driven by I mean, major climatic event and not by a kind of continuous uh, change? Uh, uh, I, I think, yeah, well, it, of course it can. It, it's just hard to tell. Um, so, of course, it would be really nice uh, now I have this overall reconstruction uh, to look in detail. So, of course, I, I have ideas. So, some basins have very nice outcrops. So, there you can look in at much higher detail. Uh, yeah, when exactly the over overspill events took place. Um, so yeah, to look for more tephra and see if uh, if this can be dated much more precisely. Mm -hmm. So yeah, because now I, I I do not really know how the the timing of the integration events relates to, uh, for example, glacial interglacial cyclicity. So yeah. But of course, you can also just have one major event of, yeah, with suddenly a very deep lake and it spills over. And, uh, but for example, I, I, I don't think that the overspill events were very catastrophic, uh, but of course they also don't need to be. So if you just have uh, quite high lake levels for some time, you can just have erosion now and then. Um, yeah. But of course, they can be related to extreme events. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay, we'll move. Uh, we've got two more in the queue for the moment. Uh, this one is from Luca Malatesta, uh, who says, thanks and well done. Um, and he is wondering if the spillover or capture path or the way in which the subcatchments get linked is always the same, or if uh, depending on forcing conditions, the spillover or piracy can happen along different paths, like spilling over into a different basin, or maybe a basin spilling and ending up draining out to sea. Um, and if uh, the the second part is, if um, that path is not always the same, um, do you observe uh, kind of a characteristic uh, stream architecture caused by spillover relative to what you would expect from piracy? Um, yeah, or, mm -hmm. or is that path sort of always consistent? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so about the first question. Uh, so if I understand it well, um, Luca, you're asking if the, um, yeah. So I, I think, so most basins, they, uh, what is it? If they overspill, they overspill into a basin that's still closed. Um, so that's kind of the overall pattern of overspill, uh, but then soon after the next basin uh, spills over, so that's the top-down pattern. Um, but we also see exceptions, so uh, maybe you remember that in, in the central parts, uh, one of the basins near L'Aquila, it, uh, yeah, it has been a deeper center for quite a long time, so that's the time when you at all those uh, large delta systems building out. Um, so there are also, yeah, there is quite some variability in there as well. Uh, but I think that's also typical for the central Apennines where there is quite a lot of variability. Uh, for example, um, the paper from uh, Rapash about the Rio Grande River, there they really have a very nice 
top down pattern all the way. So yeah, but I think here just simply because it's a very complex area with a lot of inheritance and uh, active tectonics, so active folding. Uh, and now I have to think about the second question. So is there a characteristic stream architecture, architecture caused by spillover as opposed to, uh, hold on, as opposed to this? Yeah, um, well, as of course, so as soon as you have the integration event, uh, then the implications uh, from both processors uh, are very similar. So both in, in both cases, uh, yeah, you get deep incision. Uh, you get, of course, the, the, the terrace formation. So it's very hard, yeah, uh, what is it? Simply based on what you see in the basins, what's left, and looking at the nick point to distinguish between both. Uh, I, I, yeah, what I, I think is the best way to move forward is, is kind of to get a better constraints on uh, the efficiency of headwood erosion. Uh, I think, uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I, yeah, I don't think we know much about that, how, how fast this, uh, are really the heads of a, of a river, how fast that, that, does that migrate upstream? And of course, how does it relate to the, to the lithology? So, uh, no, but I don't think it's, there's a characteristic stream architecture difference. Yeah. Thanks, Annelien. Uh, so there is another question from uh, Scott Fian. Uh, so uh, his question is about the initial condition. So what sets the initial condition of your landscape evolution model on slide nine? And uh, second question, how sensitive uh, the spillover processes is to uh, the initial configuration of your model? And can you, in some I mean, model you have maybe run, uh, can you see some uh, control not by spillover, but more by a kind of bottom to up uh, erosion wave? So I can uh, imagine an Edward uh, erosion wave. Mm -hmm. um, well, um, so I think the, uh, so it kind of relates to the question that Phoebe was asking. Uh, so it's, um, so if I would, because the initial condition, I think, uh, uh, it, it's meant the topography then, or maybe the lithology, because of course the lithology was also uniform in my model. Uh, so of course these will, would all uh, affect um, the, the results, but not the trend. So um, yeah, so you always go from uh, internal to external drainage. So I don't think it's, it's very sensitive to that. Um, and then, yeah, so would it be possible to, um, well, important to mention is because I, I do not directly have uh, a separate hill slope algorithm in a model. Uh, so one thing you could wonder, of course, do I have enough uh, erosion at my interflues? But uh, there is actually erosion because the model is not differentiating between fluvial channels and so there's always some kind of fluvial erosion at my interflues. So I checked for that and it's quite significant. So there is erosion at my interflues as well. Uh, but I don't see a way with this model to uh, make headwood erosion dominant. Okay. So I can't see any more questions. So maybe it's time to, uh, to close down this uh this first meeting, except if someone is uh, rapidly typing uh, that he has a question, but otherwise we will, uh, I think, stop now. Uh, I would have a last question. Okay, yes, of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thanks for the nice talk. Um, I was wondering, like you were showing in your slides that once you actually initiated um, overspill, you triggered several overspilling events, like a cascade. Uh -huh. But then there's still, this one part upstream which is not integrated in the externally drained system yet. So 
so for some reason overspill start to stop there or this part hasn't been integrated yet so do you know or can you tell why this is the case um have you been to the field and does it look like it's soon to overspill or yeah what's the situation with this still internally drained part at the very upstream end yeah so you mean at the the Ficino basin at the drainage divide yes exactly yeah so well it is the the biggest fault in the area um, and I think if I remember correctly, it has uh, had an increase in slip rates uh, by a factor of five. So, um, yeah, so my idea about this basin is that it's simply uh, is, yeah, creating accommodation at such a high pace uh, that it simply outpaces the sediment supply. Um, so, yeah, so of course that's, that's another. So either you can have that it's kind of survived or you can simply have that the substance rates are so high that it outpaces the, the sediment supply. Yeah, okay, thanks. I was just wondering why it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, why it was different <laughs> than the others. Thanks a lot. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, uh, Steffi, for this question. Uh, so, okay, so it's time to, uh, I think, stop this, uh, this seminar. Thanks a lot again, Annalyn, for, for this very interesting talk. I mean, most questions started by a very nice talk. It was really nice. <laughs> So I think your yeah. is going to, to go uh, really, really well. So good <laughs> luck with that on, uh, on Monday. Thanks. And uh, once again, uh, congratulations for this very uh, nice talk. Thanks. And uh, to the other one, see you uh, next uh, Thursday at the same time. And it was very nice to, to have so many people uh, attending this uh, seminar. So thanks again. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. <laughs>